Praise the Lord. What a privilege to be with you this morning. Amen. Aren't you glad for Jesus? What a difference he makes in our hearts and in our lives. Praise his blessed name. I invite our attention tonight to the book of, or to this afternoon, this morning. It's, I've already preached once, so I'm thinking it's Sunday night. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Praise the Lord. Let's stand in honor of God's word for a moment this morning. The last chapter of the book of Matthew, looking down at the last verse, letting our eyes fall down to verse 20. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. What's the next word? Amen. Father, thank you for the amen. That means so be it. Father, would you bless our hearts this morning. We're looking to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to use these words for our text and for the subject I'd like to speak to you about this morning, I'd like to speak to you this morning on the subject, Lo, I am with you always. The words of a risen Savior. Praise the Lord. <laughs> We're here this morning because we have a risen Savior. Death could not hold him. The devil could not defeat him. The grave couldn't keep him. He's a risen Savior. What excitement that must have been on that day. What happiness. He's risen. We can't hardly imagine, folks. I remember my grandpa died when I was six years old. And I remember during the funeral... I guess it was the funeral. It was at the funeral home anyways. Maybe that was the wake. But I was sitting there, my six-year-old little mind. Mom was sitting next to me, and I looked at Grandpa laying in the casket. And as I just kind of stared at him, it looked like he was breathing. I said, Mom, he's breathing. She said, no, honey, he's not breathing. He's dead. He's a risen Savior. Yes. He's breathing. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Oh, this is the unbelievable. Just shortly before that, the unbelievable happened. He opened blinded eyes and uh, healed lame legs and crippled arms and opened blind eyes and unstopped the ears and even made the dead to rise to life. Was now hanging on a cross. I can't hardly believe that. To see the Savior walk through the dusty fields of Galilee and do all of the miracles he does. And then to hang him on a cross. But now once again the unbelievable had taken place. He's risen. He came to minister. He came to serve. He came to lead. He came to guide. He taught. He admonished. He chastened. And he comforted. And now his last message before he leaves and go to heaven. He gives instructions to his disciples, tarry until you be endued with power from on high. They did that. They went and waited in the, in the upper room. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Folks, did you know that's the norm? God has two wills for us. One, he said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. First of all, he wills for us to be saved. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all been lost. And the first will for God is that you get saved. But then he says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. He wants you to be saved. That forgives our sins. And when he sanctifies us, he crucifies that sinful nature. 
that something in our heart that makes us sin. No wonder he told the disciples, you are to tarry. Now guess what? About, if you read uh, in the scriptures in Corinthians and stuff, about 500 people heard that message to tarry. But they had a big dropout rate in that day also. For only 120 went in that upper room. Father, don't be a part of the fallout crowd today. Tarry. Wait until he comes and sanctifies you wholly. And now he gives instructions. He tells them, Lo, I am with you always. Folks, and that's a message to us. That means he's going to be there with every fight with the enemy. Folks, we're in a fight. Whether you know not or whether you know it or not, you're in a fight for your never dying, never ending soul. And Paul said, I have fought a good fight. Has anybody ever been in a fight? Do you know what the definition of a good fight is? One that you win. You never hear anybody bragging, man, boy, did I get the snot whooped out of me. I mean, oh, look at that. I worked in a donut shop and there, there, was, there was three brothers and a sister and they're all characters. And one of the brothers, he's telling me, I, when I was in high school, one of the big bullies got me in the hallway. He said, come on, man, come on. I'm going to knock you into next week. Well, right away, a whole group gathered around and I couldn't get out of there and I didn't want to fight him, so I didn't put my arms up. But he was going, come on, come on, man. I'll knock you into next week. Come on, just put your arms up. He said, man, I didn't want to fight. I knew he would do that. But all of a sudden, my sisters walked up behind him and grabbed him by the hair, swung him around, and put him down on the ground and kicked him. Said, you leave my brother alone. He said, I never had problems with him once again. <laughs> Woo! The definition of a good fight is one we win. Folks, I intend to win this fight. Paul said, I fought a good fight. Why? He's going to win this. He's there for every darkness, every dark hour in the night, and we face those. He's there in every solitary hour in room of grief. He's there in every field of conquest. He said, lo, I am with you always. Praise his blessed name. Now I'm going to tell you something. God is omnipresent. Jesus is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at all times. And yet he has the ability to withhold his presence until it seems like he's absent. And every one of us, when we begin to walk with Jesus, God will do that with us. He'll withhold our presence. How many have ever prayed and prayed and it seemed like your prayers weren't going anywhere? You know, they're just brass. God does that on purpose. He's present even though it seems like he's absent. He can do that. We can't do that. We have to be present. Either you're present or you're absent. But he can be present and make it seem like he's absent because he's trying to teach us the just shall live by faith. We're not just going by emotion. We're not just going by feeling. And so we see he's there for our every field of conquest. Lo, I am with you always. Notice what that tells us this morning. It tells us he'll never fail. Now, people fail, men fail, women fail, generals fail, armies fail, doctors fail, lawyers fail, administrators fail. We failed. On this side, how many's ever failed? Okay, how many on this side? Usually I get more hands on the second side. <laughs> We've all failed. But folks, he'll never fail. He'll never fatigue, he'll never grow weary. And he'll never be confounded or outdone. He's Christ. In this world, there's limitations. But with him, there are no limitations. Praise the Lord. Until the day that this world is ablaze. And Peter said one of these days, this world is the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. Folks, one of these days. This earth has been baptized in water. Did you know that? The Bible is full of types and shadows. In other words, God is an excellent teacher. He gives us the message of salvation. We know that. We can tell that with us standing on our head. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. We, we know that, don't we? But God gives us, reiterates the lesson over and over. And just like he said, believe and be baptized with water. 
Then he said, there's coming one who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Folks, this whole earth, when sin entered into the world, this whole earth is groaning and travailing for the day of redemption. It was baptized in water. When? With Noah in the flood. And it's going to be baptized with fire. As Peter said, one of these days, God is going to renovate this whole earth and burn up everything that sin has polluted. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. That's the scripture. And one of these days, there'll be no guilt to, to scar. There'll be no sorrow to hurt. And until God walks with mankind again, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I love that. He said, lo, I'm with you always. Notice next, who is this precious promiser? He's the second person of the triune Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And in the scriptures it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. We beheld His glory, full of the glory of God. He said, all things are made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ, He's the creating fountain and, and the doer of all creation. He's the vehicle of created expression. He's inscrutable, he's mystical, he's unknown, and yet he reveals himself. He says, in me was life, and life was the light of men, and the light that shineth in darkness. Oh, aren't you glad he shines in darkness? The blind man, born blind. Did you know there was a man born blind and Jesus made, healed him? But not only was there a, born, a man born blind, but that was indicative to every single one of us. When we're born, we're born away from God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're blind to God. We're blind to eternity. We're blind to the love of God until he touches your eyes and you begin to see, oh, there's a, an eternal God and I have to do something about my never dying soul. Oh, he gives us sight. In him is life. Life and life more abundant. That's, the, that's, that's being saved and sanctified, folks. Now, before I became a Christian, I thought I had the world by the tail. I thought, I mean, I was 19, had a big paying job, had a brand new car, brand new motorcycle. <laughs> I had it made. Thought I was living. Brother, I was a captive. I was a slave to sin and guilt and condemnation. And until I knew Jesus, when I was 19 years old, I, I got saved. Brother, I found out what life was. Oh, have you found out what life really is? And he said, life more abundant. That's the sanctified life. You, you see, life comes from God. I was home working in my upstairs room, and I heard things dropping on the roof. At first, you know, first I thought, what is that? Oh, yeah, there's an oak tree out there. It's dropping acorns. How many have picked up a, you know, a little acorn? Did you know when you hold that little acorn, in that little acorn, there's a great mighty oak tree? The potential of it. Yes, sir. I mean, we've all ate corn on the bone, haven't we? Corn on the bone? Yeah, that's what I called it when I was a little kid. We'd have corn on the cob. And I said, Mom, I want some corn on the bone. Well, we've all ate the corn on the cob. But you take one kernel of corn and plant it in the ground, and, and folks, it has the potential. It's going to have a stalk, maybe with two or three ears on it, and all kinds of kernels of corn. Yes, and in us, there's life. And life more abundant. Uh, we notice uh, He is the enduring love of God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The lovely for the unlovely. Thank his blessed name. And in the book of John, uh, it resembles an art gallery. The word uh, reproducing, the light revealing, Christ registering, uh, and the lamb redeeming, the son of God uh, representing, the master receiving, the king rejoicing, and the son of man remaining. Lo, I am with you always. I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. The author of salvation. He's the ancient of days. Before him there was no body. 
There's not going to be anybody after him. He's the Almighty. What the Bible says, he's came to fulfill. He's going to fulfill it again, folks. We ought to clap our hands and slap our feet. He's fulfilling the word. Oh, people are getting distressed. What's happening in America? No, no, no. The word of God is just being fulfilled. Did you know any time Israel abandoned God, God brought them into judgment? Look at our nation. Over 40 years ago, we got rid of the Bible. Remember uh, Judge Moore? We got rid of the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. How many remember O.J. in his trial? A couple people there. Any, how many remember on this side? It's always more on the second side. Remember O.J. in the trial. How many remember hearing over and over and over by the news media how we have to revamp the judicial system? Remember that, dear and O.J.? We have to revamp the judicial system. Who remembers who was president then? Clinton. And all of a sudden, it was the polls. What are the polls saying? What did the polls say? Folks, nothing happens by mistake or accident. Nothing. When this world starts turning upside down, folks, it's all planned. And we see here, when we get rid of God's word, when we get rid of the Ten Commandments, we now have to rely upon the polls and opinion of people. That's why they're revamping the judicial system. Folks, hold on, it's going to get worse. You read about Sharia law, it's going to get worse. But here we see, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and he's the last. And when Israel abandoned God, God always brought Israel into judgment. Why? To try and bring them back. We've taken the Ten Commandments out. We've taken prayer out. We've taken the Bible out. We've abandoned God. We killed babies. We euthanized the old people. See, that's not happening. Oh, you better wake up. It is happening. We're abandoning God and God's judgments are coming. Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Who would ever think that we'd be where we are today with Sodom and Gomorrah? God's judgments are being loosed on this nation, folks, because we have abandoned God. Take a look uh, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 51. Read that later when you go home. Prophecy is twofold. It's then and in the future. And that prophecy not only had to do with Babylon then, it had to do with Babylon in the future. And I believe with all my heart, you read Revelation 17, 18, America is mystery Babylon. And if that be so, reading there in, uh, in Jeremiah 51, he tells us that this country will be invaded by spoilers. Now you look at our nation, we're open on both the north and the south, our borders are open. And we see all kinds of people coming. We call them today terrorists, the Bible called them spoilers. Folks, it's written in the scripture. We're seeing what happens when a nation abandons God. God brings them into judgment. But in the midst of that, I want you to know, he said, Lo, I'm with you always. Oh, he's going to be there. He's our rock. Uh, he's our foundation. He's our advocate with the Father. He's our anchor of our soul. Oh, no matter what happens, I'm going through with God. You better have your mind made up, folks. Not only that, he's the bright and morning star. He's the glory of God. Uh, he's the one who uh, 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 was dead and yet lie, lives forevermore. He's our blessed potentate. He's our lawyer. He's the one we can go to when we have trials and troubles. And we see he's demonstrated this power to fulfill in the, the overcomers. And in the fact that him and the Father are one. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, and let them be one with me as I am one with the Father. Are you connected today? Oh, he's the one that will see us through. We see the priority of his authorship. We see the fidelity of his friendship. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. <laughs> My world's been turned upside down. My heart goes out to you that lost this precious loved one. I think every funeral I've ever had as a pastor, 
I've always said death is the unbelievable reality of life. It's unbelievable because when it's all said and done, you go home, the chair is empty. Those tennis shoes are empty. It's the unbelievable reality. You wake up the next day, you don't hear their voice. But when my wife passed away 14 months ago, it was like I was standing on the outside looking in when I said death is the unbelievable reality of life. But folks, when my wife passed away, I stepped on the inside and I'm looking out on the outside. Death has a whole different meaning. Death will have a whole different meaning to you folks. It does. But in the midst of death, he is the resurrection in life. And I've thought so many times, especially the first couple months, people would write and and Facebook and different things, text me. I'm praying for you, Brother Peter. Folks, I felt those prayers. And those of you that lost this precious boy, you'll feel those prayers. You'll know those people love you and they're praying for you. Why? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The song singer this morning said, why, why do bad things happen to good people? That's because he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. He's no respecter of persons. Just because we pick up our cross and follow Jesus, folks, our lives can turn upside down too. But we have a choice. What am I going to do when it does turn upside down? Notice uh, what this promiser provides. Uh, he provides a freedom from the slavery of sin. Hallelujah this morning. The shackles of habits of sin. Before I became a Christian, I thought I had to quit the sin business. Anybody ever like that? You know, I thought when I could quit the drugs and the drinking and the swearing, I'd be good enough to be called a Christian. I didn't understand about Jesus. But I could never quit it. I couldn't tell you how much dope I threw out or flushed down the toilet. and How many times I tried to quit drinking. But the next Friday, the next Saturday, the next Monday, the next opportunity, right back at, at it. You can't quit the sin business because we have a sinful nature. But Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The night I got saved, I got saved in the hospital bed. I didn't come to an altar here. I made an altar in the, in the hospital. I had a I had an instant replay. Anybody ever see instant re replay on TV? Now, you all aren't from Wisconsin, but the Packers just made a touchdown. <laughs> instant replay. The Packers just made a touchdown. <laughs> Brother, I was in a coma for almost a month. Told my mom and dad, he's going to die. He's not going to make it. If he wakes up, he'll be a vegetable. When I woke up, I looked at the doctor. I said, I didn't know what kind of vegetable it would be, whether a cucumber or lettuce. That was because grandma prayed. But all of a sudden, I saw an instant replay. I had rationalized with God. I thought if I ever going to die, I'd be in a car wreck in the last moment. I can say, hey, up there, forgive me. And off to heaven, I'd go. When that drunk driver hit me when I was riding my motorcycle, folks, when I come to, I never once thought of my pre-rationalization. You can't play games with God and win. In fact, I cried out and said, God, let me die and get this over with. I was in so much pain. But all of a sudden, I saw the instant replay. And preacher, I saw myself say, God, let me die and get, oh, get this over with. And it was just like God put his finger on my heart and said, Larry, now where would you be if I heard that? And I realized I'd be in hell. 19 years old, I didn't want to go to hell. But I knew, and I didn't know the Bible, but there's a verse in the Bible that says, when you seek me with your whole heart, I shall be found. He said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. I didn't know about that. But all of a sudden, at 19, I saw I was headed to hell. And I prayed a prayer, <laughs> Brother Nathaniel, from the depths of my being. I cried out to God for all I was worth. God, I want you to forgive me. I want you to save me. I want Jesus in my heart. I don't think it took two minutes. And all of a sudden, it was just like something washed a heavy load away. Woo! The Lord. I knew he heard me. I knew he saved me. I instantly prayed another prayer. I said, Father. Now, I didn't know the theology. I was dumb and stupid. And I didn't know the Bible. But listen, folks, a couple things just transpired. When God heard my prayer, first of all, he justified me. He forgave me. And he adopted me. When you're living in sin, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. The devil don't care for you. He doesn't claim you and he doesn't want you. But he's your father. 
But when I prayed through, Paul says we have to be quickened. What is that? Well, we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Your body. Sister, that's the garage you're parked in right now. Really? One of these days you're going to leave the garage. My wife left the garage. Soul, that's you. Your soul, that's you. That's your personality. That's that part of you that's going to live on forever and ever and ever, either in heaven or hell. You can't say, well, I'm not going to exist. No, no, no. That's not God's word. So I don't believe in hell. I love meeting those people that tell me that. They say, oh, I don't believe in hell or I don't believe in God. I instantly look at them and I say, I don't believe fire's hot. And almost every time it gets a a smile on their face because they know. If I would light a match and put my finger over that itsy bitsy match flame, I would instantly become a believer. Just because we say, I don't believe in God, that doesn't make God go away. And because you say, I don't believe in hell, that doesn't make hell go away. And when I prayed that prayer, and he saved me. Now that word saved. Remember in the Bible, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. I was lost. He saved me. In the Greek, that word means delivered. When you get saved, he delivers us. Brother, I didn't even have to try quitting swearing. It was done. I didn't have to say, pardon my French or bite my tongue. It was gone. He delivered me. The drugs, they were gone. The drinking, it was gone. And I prayed, Father, I can't stand all this pain, but my heart is right. Take me to heaven tonight. That's what my second prayer was. No, he didn't take me to heaven. He did something else that night. But I look back at this, the theology of it, Even though I was ignorant in my mind and I didn't know the Bible, God, like Paul said, quickened my spirit. When you're born again, he quickens our spirit. And my spirit recognized God as my father. Isn't that neat? Oh, folks, it's wonderful. I'm talking about a savior. I'm talking about a heavenly father. He promises grace to help in times of trial. Hey, life is filled with trials. My boy, when he was little going to school, he said, Dad, I wish we were born smart. Well, that'd be nice, but we're not. Life is filled with trials. Uh, He provides strength in times of sorrow. (laughs) Take your sorrowing, bleeding, grieving hearts. Let the Lord help you. Oh, I want you to know in the last 14 months have been the richest, closest I've probably ever lived to God. We tell Melissa, my daughter, I'm glad she's with me today. We tell Melissa, More than likely, one or both of us are going to die before you, but that's what we're living for. We're living to go to heaven. I just wasn't expecting such a soon departure on Liz's part. But when she departed, folks, I want you to know he can be ours, our strength, our habitation, our dwelling. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Folks, I want you to know this last 14 months, It's probably been some of the richest, deepest times of my life because I've drawn near to him. Drawn near to him, folks. He provides escape for temptation. He provides comfort for the weary. He provides light at the end of the way. How is this promise produced? In works. The works produce themselves because of who said it. He said it. I, lo, I am with you always. He's there for the asking. Ask. We had a car accident. I laid seven weeks in the hospital in traction. Had my leg in traction and my neck in traction. Pulled from both ends. Then I got a halo cast for seven weeks and couldn't drive or do anything. Only went to church one time with my halo cast on. Bobby, I had a halo. Screwed to my head, two screws here and two screws in the back, and then metal come down to my shoulders, and then they had plaster of Paris down to my hips, and all I could do is look straight ahead. They shaved all the hair off my head. I wanted wavy hair, but it waved goodbye. (laughs) But I kind of looked like a light bulb with four screws in it, you know? And I sat in the back of the church, and this, this little kid kept turning around looking at me, because you know, I, I look like a Martian, I guess. And finally, I just kind of made a face and went, <laughs> oh, he spun around and grabbed his mama's arms. I, he didn't turn around after that at all. 
but I had my halo. <laughs> Folks, is your halo slipped? Some people, they're, 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 my halo's gone. <laughs> Not only slipped, but it's gone. But I want you to know he's there. He's a promiser. He provides to be there. It's, he's there for the asking. And I'd been in the hospital seven weeks, seven weeks with this halo. Only been to church once. And, and pastor, when they finally got the halo off and I could drive spiritually, I felt so dry. I hadn't been, I didn't backslide. I didn't go away from God. Have you ever got to a place where you felt dry? Yes, Folks, as a young Christian, I, I began to read in the Bible. And I, I read about the children of Israel. And I realized, hey, our walk is just like the children of Israel. We go through the wilderness of sin. Then we go through the wilderness. Then we go through times when there's no food. And God provides the quail. And he provides the bread. And then there's times where we're in the wilderness and don't know. Hey, that's our, our Christian experience. We're learning just like the children of Israel. And I felt so dry. Remember them when they didn't have any water? Listen, they found the rock that, that, that Moses split. And it's like a four-story rock. Has anybody ever seen that? There's pictures of it. It was split from the top to the bottom. And, and they can look at it now and they can see water ran out of that at one time. I could now drive. I told Lizzie, I said, "Hun, my mom and dad had a cabin up by the lake. I said, I'm going up by the cabin for three days or so. I've got to get in touch with God. I need a fresh touch of God. She said, well, do what you got to do. And I packed my some food in the sleeping bag and got in my car. My heart's breaking. I want God. I went a quarter mile down the road, turned right. Went a mile down the road, turned left. I made it about another quarter mile. My heart is all crying. I'm thinking I have to go three weeks, I mean three days up to the mountain to have a fresh touch of God. And my heart's crying, oh God, I need you. And all of a sudden I heard that voice from another world. Have you ever heard that voice from another world? He'll speak to you in a language you understand. That voice said, then the just shall live by faith. And all of a sudden, God just began to pour the blessed Holy Spirit upon my soul. Oh, I got so blessed, I had to pull the car over. I had so many tears coming, and I was so rejoicing. I had to pull over. I couldn't see where I was going. I don't know how long I sat there. Oh, glory, glory, praise the Lord. The just, folks, he's there for the asking. Yeah. When it all subsided, subsided, I went the rest of the mile down, made a left-hand turn, waited a mile and a quarter, made a left-hand turn, drove in the driveway. Liz said, what are you doing home so soon? I said, oh, I don't need to go. The Lord met me. Hey, the Lord will meet you. He's there for the asking. Praise his blessed name. Lo, I am with you always. Who is this promiser? Who is this promise preserved for? Lo, I'm with you always, all of earth's redeemed. He's there for you. It's been bought by the blood of Jesus. He's there for you. Lo, I'm with you always. I know it seems like sometimes he's disappeared, but I told you, that's him. He's omnipresent. He can make it seem like he's absent, but he's there if you look. He's there. One time... After I had that motorcycle accident, I was in so much pain. So much pain. In the middle of the night, uh, I couldn't sleep. And I got the phone that was by my bedside and I dialed that number, 231-7161. My dad answered about one o'clock in the morning. I said, Dad, I hurt so bad, could you come? I might have got a shot because I kind of dozed off. But folks, as I was dozing off, all of a sudden, my left hand, I felt my dad's hand. My dad's always been my hero. That strong, calloused hand. He took a hold of my hand and just squeezed. He let me know he was there. <laughs> I'll never forget that as long as I live. And folks, that's just like it, Jesus does it in even greater measure. Lo, I am with you always. Could I have the pianist come to the piano? Would you come? He said, Lo, I'm with you always. I want us to stand. Can we bow our heads? I don't know where you are this morning. 
I don't know if you know Jesus as your Savior, but he promised and said, Lo, I'm with you always. As she begins to play, Father, would you touch our hearts this morning? What a Savior. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Maybe there's somebody this morning with a broken, bleeding heart. Maybe there's trouble in the home, trouble on the job. Maybe just trouble in your heart. Won't you let the Lord take a hold of your hand? Start a life of faith and confidence in Him. Because He said, Lo, I'm with you always. This altar's open for you this morning. Is there anyone? Would you like to come and pray? Is there anybody like that this morning? Lo, I am with you always. But you have to make up your mind that you're going to go with Him. You can't resist him, refuse him, and rebel against him and stay in a life of sin. No, no, no. You have to come with him, and you come with him. He takes a hold of your heart, and he's saying, Lo, I am with you always. And she plays this morning. Is there anyone you'd like to come and pray? Maybe there's someone who'd say, and no looking around, folks, let's close our eyes and be prayerful. But maybe there's somebody who'd say, preacher, I'm not coming to the altar, but I'm going to raise my hand. Would you remember me in prayer? Is there anybody like that? Preacher, pray for me. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. That doesn't save you. That doesn't... That that just kind of identifies yourself. I'm willing to be identified. I see your hand. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. Father, you see these that have raised their hand and maybe there's others. Their hearts are beating fast because you're trying to deal with them. Would you help us not to get away from this message and just realize Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. Bless these people. Bring us back tonight, expecting to meet with you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Shake hands and be friendly. And you are dismissed.